So thank you, Brad, Jeremiah, and Michael. Um, so we have, uh, we're right on time. Uh, we have 15 minutes for a QA. and a uh, So please, um, uh, I hope you appreciate the fact that we just went through the presentations. You <coughs> likely had some questions after each presentation. So keep those in mind. Uh, I will be asking for questions for the audience in a few minutes. I actually wanted to start off with a question of my own. Um, so uh, bringing in the, the keynote, which I found quite inspiring, and especially took note of this um, acronym, Do Something Meaningful. Um, I'm wondering, and if each of you could answer this question in your own way, um, between inspiration and application, so between the inspiration of room temperature, natural chemical processes, uh, or um, me mechanical, the mechanics of vertebrates, between that inspiration and the application on, to environmental challenges, how do you balance your work? How do you make decisions on what to focus on, um, what to be inspired by, how to apply your work? Um, and I think everyone does it differently. So I'm very interested in your individual responses to that question. Brad, do you want to start? I can start. I, I would say, you know, for us, the uh, balance is very dynamic. I think sometimes you start uh, with an early stage idea, um, maybe something that's just a scientific curiosity. And as this develops, it, it goes somewhere. I think other times you start with a, a key um, need or, or a desire to address an application, and things are very driven by the desire to make immediate progress on that. Um, and, and at least in, in uh, my short career so far, I think things always swing back and forth as a function of time, from uh, more science-driven developments to more technology-driven developments to even uh, specifically trying to apply and commercialize a given technology to, to impact a person. Um, and I guess my view is to be open to the best opportunities as they come along, um, regardless of where they're coming. So always keep an open mind uh, and to be you know, ready. I think I can't predict when I or mostly when my students would be inspired. Um, but you know, it's like if you want to be struck by lightning, go to the top of a tall building in a storm. And so I think we kind of take that philosophy, being, being open to, to good ideas as they come and trying to be ready to seize it. Um, I second that. I don't really have much else to say. Um, um, it's, it's hard to predict. It's hard to plan these things. I think when, when, you, when you start a lab, uh, which both Brad and I did not that long ago, uh, you know, you're driven by some interest in, in, a, in, in fundamental discovery, fundamental science. Um, and, then, and then eventually, those advances, especially when you're working this, this area of developing new ways to, to make polymers, then, I mean, Polymers are used in everything, right? So if, we, if you could develop a new way to make one, there's a good chance there will be applications, although I oftentimes don't start out with those applications as what is driving it. Although in, in some cases, we, we definitely do that as well, um, similar to what Brad said. And so uh, being open to, uh, I mean, MIT is amazing because the students and postdocs we work with and the faculty that we get to work with are, are all incredible and, and we just, it's a privilege to have the opportunity to have these brilliant students kind of uh, help take these ideas and, and, and morph them and turn them into even better ideas and uh, listening to their inspiration and working with them is really just, I think it just happened naturally. It's hard to, it's hard to explain. I, I think there are different ways of, 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 of responding. If you are in a field where uh, the questions have been sort of posed, and you know the challenges, and you are working hard to find new breakthroughs in that area. It's one way of thinking about it. The other way is, and I'm talking particularly for more mature areas, where you know there are some problems that could not be solved. All of a sudden, you find that because you can borrow from other technologies, these problems become solvable. So I think what we are doing here, bringing people from various areas, is, is fundamental because 
we need the enabling tools, we need the new ideas, and they don't come from your own area, they come from other areas. So that's very enabling. And I'll put also my, my own spin of the biomimetics in my particular case where nature offers such an example. But there, again, you need to borrow from technologies. We, we never had these tools before, so that's why we couldn't do it. Do it. We had them in front of us, but we couldn't emulate. So it's a combination of... Yeah. No, the, the point you made about the application of uh, tools, technologies, methods from one discipline into something else is... Uh, um, that that strikes me as a, an extraordinarily powerful and prevalent mode for addressing challenges because it's often that the, the application is not necessarily the driving motivation or even clear when, when, one, when one begins. So I do then, uh, I do want to leave time for questions from the audience. You've had three presentations. It's a lot of material to, to take in. Um, any, any first questions? Anyone, anyone want to take a stab at a question? Right over here. So a question for Jeremiah, just a curiosity question. So if you took your material and you put it out in sunlight, and it had UV and green light, what would it do? Does it get confused or does it do something, something else? That's, that's a great question. And um, I would imagine that uh, it would get a little bit confused. <laughs> And I wouldn't recommend doing that with this particular iteration of the material. Um, I think that it would, uh, most likely, if it were in its stiff state, the large cage state, where upon absorption of green light it turns into the smaller cage, it would probably do that because it absorbs more strongly. The extinction coefficient is stronger than the green. So it would switch back down to its more dynamic fluid-like state. So <coughs> maybe that could be useful. I've had some crazy ideas for thinking about these as actually ways to harvest solar energy, have a, a, a nice, full, stiff material, absorb light, convert it to a fluid-like material that could flow, do some work, switch it back, and have it repeat that process. But that's, that's kind of out there. Uh, it's a good question, though. And in the, in the, in the photo growth based system, we have the same potential issue. Under UV light, long exposure, the material might creep be just because the dynamics of the network change are activated by light in that case. Too. Another question? Over here. Um, yeah, hi, thanks very much for the presentations. Um, if we're gonna have a sustainable future, we're gonna have to pay attention to all spatial temporal scales, right? From global to regional to personal. And I've been working with a group of graduate students on uh, very fine-grained exposures to particles. Um, so we're focused on ultrafine or ambient nanoparticles. And we have to use bench instruments. So we do our environmental epidemiology at a 20 meter grid for every hour of the year for every person in the environmental epidemiology studies. And we don't have any small sensors that can count ultrafine particles. It'd be great to have a sense of organics and polarity and of transition metals, but we're still stuck on a sensor that can accurately count the ultrafine particles in a near highway environment, uh, people inhale about 100 trillion of those ultrafine particles per year. They exhale about 20% of them, so there's 80% of them in the body uh, for at least a protracted period, and they cause very high health risks. Do you have any ideas? I mean, I'd love a solution in a week or two, but maybe some ideas. <laughs> well, clearly not a week or two. <laughs> Uh, but actually, can I uh, prevail on Brian to say a few words about the prospects for that kind of work at Sensnetta? Uh, so I can comment both on the, the prospects and actually sort of allude to some technology that will be becoming available, not in a week, um, but certainly that is the type of, of research that the capabilities, the hardware to fabricate, the hardware to, to measure will, will facilitate. Um, but we do have a, a, a student that's working on a, an aerosol sensor um, to characterize small particles of both fluid and particulate in air. Um, and I believe actually we'll have a poster out here uh, during the poster session, so. Hey, Brian, could you take one that was not just really briefly? Um, It'd be great to tie that to uh, the innate immune system. <laughs> and to tie that to the? Innate immune system. Ba basically, we, we have innate immune system which is built for reacting to biological agents, and it has a lot of trouble with persistent ambient 
agents. Other question? We have time for one more. Thank you. Quick question for J Jeremiah. Uh, you showed very interestingly that you could start with a, um, a, a parent gel and then uh, make, it, make it grow by in insertion. Would it also be possible to, uh, to use the same mechanism at a different temperature to make it depolymerize and shrink again? Yeah, uh, so there's, there's a number of ways you could do that. Um, I didn't, I didn't show the full story of this work, but so one way to make the material shrink if you would like it to do that is, is to actually add both monomer and crosslinker at the same time that you do the photopolymerization. You can actually increase the crosslinking density that way, which leads to overall the material having smaller pores and therefore expelling more solvent and having an effect of shrinking. If you want the material to actually then break down the components, you can yes. do that as well because the, 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 the primary photochemical reaction that occurs when, when the polymer chains absorb light is a cleavage of a sulfur carbon bond. And it's the carbon radical that, that propagates and makes the polymer chain, but those radicals have to recombine. But if you, if you do that just in the presence of, of something that can react with and quench a radical, what you'll do is you'll just break the polymer chains. So under the appropriate wavelength of light, the whole material will just dissolve back down to its constituents um, if you wanted to do that. But then the material would, would be lost. So if at a different temperature you can get the monomer back, would that also work? Um, I, that, that should be doable. By using the LCFT behavior, we yeah. can probably do that. Yeah, it's a good idea. Thank you. Any other questions? We do have a few seconds now. So we're heading into a break. Um, uh, please join me in thanking the speakers, Brad Jeremiah and Michael.